So my work is basically uh, all about syntax, which is the way that we put words together to create meanings. And most people who do the kind of work that I do on syntax are really interested in the ways that languages vary when they do this. So, you know, in English you say, uh, you put the verb and then you put the object. In Japanese you put the object and the verb. In Russian actually you can put the object quite far away from the verb quite often. So languages vary in different kinds of ways. And people like me, syntacticians, <coughs> we're interested in what the system is that humans have that does this variation. Right? So why, what is similar between an English speaker, a Russian speaker, a Chinese speaker, a Nungabuyu speaker in how we build sentences out of the basic bits and pieces we have. And the answers that people have given to that, and the answer that I believe is true, is that what is really similar is that we human beings have uh, a capacity to take discrete units, like words or sounds, and we put them together in hierarchical ways. We put them together in chunks, and those chunks are put together in larger chunks, and those larger chunks are put together in larger chunks, and we do this in a sort of unbounded fashion. That is, we can just continue doing this following the rules of our particular language, which is what makes our languages so creative. It's what, enables, it's what enables me to say the sentences I'm saying just now. So this is a very important part of language, the discrete, the hierarchical, and the unbounded, the unending. And that's what most of my work's about. And that's what most people who do what I do work on. But actually there's more to language than this. So that is a fundamental aspect of the nature of language. But actually when people think about language, they think about more than just this aspect of it. There's something else. There's the way we use language, what we use language to do. We don't use language just to say literal things. We don't just, you know, say, uh, I am sitting on a chair. That would be pretty boring, right? What we do is we use language to express ourselves. We use it to express our, our thoughts. We use it to express how we're feeling. We use it to express what kind of a person we are. Um, and that, I think, is another aspect of the nature of language that quite often gets lost from the perspective of people like me who are focused very much on the theory, the theory of what human language really is as far as syntax and grammar and things like that go. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some work that I did with my colleagues at Queen Mary, um, which was about how the variation in language and the, the sense of self of particular individuals who speak language end up feeding into the kinds of grammatical rules that we have in a language. So this is work um, that uh, has been done here in London, where we are right now, um, looking at the new kind of a language that emerges in teenage speak in certain areas of inner London. So um, if you go to somewhere like Hackney, Dalston, one of these areas of London, it's massively multilingual. So there's a hundred and I probably forget the number, but there's hundreds of languages spoken in the borough of Hackney. Uh, and that means that mo th through many immigrant populations, and that means that the children of these various speakers, they don't have a language which is effectively in common with each other, right? Because what they're doing is they're learning from their parents, whatever their home language is, plus some kind of second language version of English. Right? So when they come to speak to other people, they're speaking quite differently from each other. Right? So you've got some people whose parents might be from Turkey and who speak a sort of Turkish influenced version of English. You might have some people whose parents speak uh, Haitian Creole and have a Creole variety. Some speakers who might come, uh, who might have, uh, you know, some like Chinese and, and so on. So many different languages. So there's a question then, so how, what happens when you take all of these kids and you put them together? <laughs> what kind of a language emerges? Is it just a hodgepodge? Is it just a mess? Or is it structured like all the other languages we know are structured into you know, particular grammatical rules? So you'll not be surprised probably that it's the latter. So um, the, the case I want to tell you about is um, something that my colleague Jenny Cheshire noticed when she was looking at the data 
of uh, teenage speakers from Hackney. So th what the team did was they collected loads and loads and loads of data and then analyzed it statistically. And one of the things that Jenny was looking at is what's called a relative clause. So this is where I come in as a syntactician. So a relative clause is when you, um, you take a noun, like the cat, and then you add a, a clause after it. So you say the cat uh, that I love or uh, the dog that jumped on me. So you've got these extra little bits, right? So the dog that jumped on me, that's the relative clause. So relative clauses in English, um, uh, when they modify a noun which is human, so let's take something like the man or the woman, you say the woman who I saw, you can say the woman who I saw, you can also say the woman that I saw, you can say who or that, and you can also say the woman I saw. So three different ways of doing relative clauses and they're all completely normal in day-to-day -day English and everyone uses them in converse conversationally just at a random kind of, in a kind of random collection of ways when you have a human noun that you're talking about. So what Jenny noticed when she looked at this um, was that in the teenage speech of, this, of the um, children from Hackney is that actually they were using it differently than, than speakers of other varieties of English do. As I said, those three kinds of relative clause introduction, who, that, and nothing, are not really, you know, they're not really grammatically organized in standard varieties of English. There's some, there's some prescriptive norms. If you've got a human, you should use a who. So second language speakers of English often get told that, but it's just not true. That's not what people do. People use that and they use who. So in standard English, you know, you use all of them. But what Jenny noticed with the, uh, or what our team noticed with um, the, uh, the Hackney teenagers is that they began to use who when the noun, that they, the person that the noun referred to, right? You know, you've got a noun, refers to a person, when that person was an ongoing topic of the conversation. Right? So if you imagine someone who's really important, or so, you're talking about someone who's really important to you, and you say, oh, that man I met at the party, or that man who I met at the party, and then you continue talking about him. He was this guy that turned up late and no one talked to him, and then when I saw him the next day, he gets talked about a lot. He's an ongoing topic. Okay? Or you can imagine someone isn't an ongoing topic, right? Oh, those people in the bus, uh, they, they're... They were really upset when the bus blew up and something terrible happened and everyone ran away and da da da. But you don't talk about the people again, you're talking about something else. What Jenny noticed was that these hackney teenagers were structuring the two kinds of relative clause in a completely different way than normal English. So they were using who when the noun was a topic of the ongoing discourse. So you can count the number of times that that noun is referred back to. And the more it's referred back to, uh, the more likely it is that the person used who in their, in their relative clause. Now, it turns out it's even more interesting than this. So that's a new rule. It's not, I mean, no one taught the kids this, right? It's a new rule that they kind of worked out themselves. Okay, Where did it come from? So that's a really interesting question. Now, it turns out that in these various languages that, um, that are spoken by the kids that are not English, Many languages have ways of expressing topicality. So, you know, Japanese does, for example, it uses a particular particle. Uh, um, Creoles do, they have a particular way of uh, changing the verb. There's various kinds of ways that languages mark that something's a topic. English doesn't do that, right? Except for these hackney kids. So what seems to have happened is that what these kids have done is they've, it's, it's like there's, there's this floating feature around. It's like, grammatical concept of topic that other languages are using and it's not being used in English and the kids because they're not getting full input in English they're getting second language English what they're doing when they're talking to each other is reorganizing the way they're speaking and taking advantage of this kind of floating feature that's around okay and so they use that to organize their own grammar and it turns out that it's even more specific than this so um, the more multilingual and multi-ethnic you are, right? If, you're, if you've got tons and tons of friends who all speak second languages, right? then you're much more likely to use, use this grammatical rule, this new grammatical rule, 
than if you've got mainly you know monolingual friends. So it really turns out to be the case that you know it's in a sense an expression of uh, your identity as a hackney teenager, completely subconscious. It's, you don't know you're doing this, right? But it expresses who you are when you start using this grammatical rule like that. So that's really interesting, I think, because what it shows is is the emergence of a new rule, and that new rule emerges through social factors, right? It emerges through the ways that people interact with each other, the ways that they want to be close to each other, uh, and it's done completely unconsciously. They don't know they're doing this. You can see it in the data, if you look, right? You can see in the data that this new rule has appeared, but they don't know they're doing this. And that's how all language works, right? When I'm putting these sentences together right now, I don't know what rules I'm using to put them together. I just put them together and they work. And you, I'm not conscious of the rules. I can make myself conscious and because I'm a linguist. I probably do know a lot of those rules. But people can speak perfectly well without knowing them. And what's happening in this group of Hackney teenagers is they've innovated. They've added a new rule into their system. And that is as much part of the nature of language, right? This creation of new grammatical rules from social factors as the very nature of the rules themselves.